Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Polly Pistol, and I'm an alcoholic. By God's grace, in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't had a drink since April the 11th of 1977. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a home group, and that's the West Connect Group in Jacksonville, Florida. I have a sponsor, and my sponsor has a sponsor, and I sponsor. And I consider those three things a necessity in order for me to be a member of good standing in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am thrilled to death to be here tonight. Harvey, thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting me. I'm just so excited to be here. Um, I, uh, my husband said to be sure and tell you guys that he sends his best. He sent me. <laughs> Um, I'm so excited to be here with the folks I'm with. Uh, Don and I've been doing this for over 30 years, that we've been friends, hanging out, coming to conferences together. In fact, when he came up, I said, Don, don't you remember when we were young and hot? You know, because we were. We were young and hot. It was great. And, ha- and But we're still having just as much fun being sober, just as much fun. And I'm so excited that Peter's going to be here speaking. I said, Peter's claim to fame is that he is engaged to my sponsee. <laughs> so I love you, Peter. Just absolutely love you. And Susie, my sponsee from New York City, came over and is going to hang out with me this weekend. So I am so excited to be with you guys. And that's what the whole deal is. This is where we get to do these conferences. Seventy-five years you guys have been doing this. That is absolutely amazing, 75 years. And we get to hang out with each other, and we get to celebrate sobriety. And this is what, this is the unity part of the triangle. This is where we get to celebrate the fellowship. And in a vision for you, it says, is there a sufficient substitute for alcohol? And yes, it is way more than a substitute. It is the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know what? We need it all. I need the steps. I need the book. I need service, I need the fellowship, but I'm here to tell you right now what got me and got me hooked was not those steps. I had no idea what they were. That book was terribly boring when I first started reading it. But I'll tell you what got me and hooked me and just got me and just reeled me in was the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was the smiles, and it still is. I've been up since 3 o'clock this morning, and I got in here, and I was tired, and I was hungry, and, you know, all of the stuff we are, you know, that happens when we travel. And you know what? As soon as I got here, I went up. The two of the cutest girls you ever saw picked me up at the airport. You get, you know, and all of a sudden it starts to click. It's the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's the thing that still puts a smile on my face and the kick in my step. And I'm so grateful to be here. And I'm so grateful that we get to celebrate together. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I should share in a general way what it used to be like, what happened, and what I'm trying to be like today. And I'm going to do that to the very best of my ability. One of the things that I want to do is that, I don't know, it, can I just see a show of hands of everybody that's a year or under of sobriety? Wow. <clears throat> okay, 
I'm going to preach for about three minutes, and then I'll quit. But one of the things that I want to, that I want to talk about is that I am 39 years sober. I am busier in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous than I've ever been. I sponsor more people than I have ever sponsored, and I'm in more service than I've ever been into. And I have a really good reason for that, and that reason is I love my life. I absolutely love my life. And the truth is that I have a progressive illness And at 39 years of sobriety, I am more alcoholic than I was 39 years ago. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I have a progressive illness. And even though I'm 39 years sober, I promise you, and there's a story in the big book of a man who didn't drink for 25 years, and he took a drink and he was dead within a year. And I don't know if you've seen anybody with long-term sobriety take a drink of alcohol, but they don't last very long. And if they even get back, and very few people get back because the ego will not release to let us get back. So I'm here to tell you that I take this disease. I have a lot of fun in sobriety. Because I can tell you, one of the things I say in the family afterwards have so much good stuff. You know, right in there it says this that we absolutely insist on enjoying life. And one of the things I do is insist on enjoying life. But I take this disease very seriously. And I'm going to keep doing that service, and I'm going to keep sponsoring those women, and I'm going to keep being having a job in my home group. I have a job in my home group. I'm the literature person, and I was the cake girl the last time around. I'm going to have a job in my home group, and if I don't get to have that kind of a job, then I'm a greeter or I'm on the cleanup committee. But you know what? I'm going to protect my sobriety. Because I know what happens to people who have long-term sobriety and they take a drink of alcohol. And I know that this disease is sitting right here and it's just waiting for me. The book tells me that the disease is patient and it's cunning and it's baffling and it's powerful. And I don't for one minute take it for granted. I'm 39 years sober, and I make five meetings a week. Now, I don't know that you have to make five meetings a week to stay sober, but, you know, one of the things is I like going. I have to have it, you know, I have a meeting that is my home group. I got to be in a book study. I got to keep at it. You know, you got to keep. And somebody says, why are you still studying that book like that? Well, my forgetter is really bad, and the older I get, the worse it gets. I need to be ever, I have to be reminded every week. I have to go, I mean, I've constantly got to be in that book. Because that book is really clear. It tells me I get a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance. And it says maintenance, so that means i got to do something. The maintenance of my spiritual condition. And I just know when I'm talking to the women I sponsor and I'm talking about that book and we're doing steps and I get to sit there, one of the greatest things I get to do is a lot of the women I sponsor send me their 11th step every night. And I get to read that. And that, gets to, that just keeps me fired up. I get to do that. And I get to, re- I get to be accountable to my sponsor. We never get too sober in this program. We never get too sober. We just get a day at a time. Uh, I'm I'm living, breathing proof that you can be a real alcoholic as described in the doctor's opinion and not come from the disease of alcoholism. To my knowledge, I do not come from the disease of alcoholism. My daddy was 60 years old when he died, and he had 60 years of sobriety. 
My mother was 87 years old when she died, and she had 87 years of sobriety. And my mom used to say, Polly, you would have never gotten into that trouble if you just wouldn't have drank. Now, my, I don't know if there's, you know, they say take an alcoholic's family tree and, an al- and shake it and an alcoholic will fall out. Well, maybe so. It, that could have been my mother's father. I don't know. He was just the only one in our family who drank. Now, I will assure you, to my recollection, he never drank like me. He just had beer from time to time. Just never drank like me. Now, I have some theories about all this, and one of the things that I want you to know is I was raised Southern Baptist. Now, when I come to New York, they're not real clear what Southern Baptist is. <laughs> they don't, you know, they're not real clear about it. Uh, I lived in Southern California for a long time. Then I lived up in Birch Bay, Washington. Now I live down in Jacksonville, Florida. I live in the South, and they're real clear what Southern Baptist is down there. And what happened was, as these, you know, I lived, I went to a Christian church, and I, they taught, they talked about Jesus, and they talked about God, and somehow, somehow, I missed a lot of that because those preachers. I mean, I'd go sit in Sunday school, and they'd tell me Jesus loves me, and then I'd go out, and I'd have to sit in the congregation, and I'd have to listen to that preacher yell. And that preacher would get up there, and he'd start be yelling, and he'd say, you're born a sinner. You're going to burn in hell. And I mean, I'm telling you, he didn't make God sound really nice. (laughs) And there wasn't a lot of niceness about God. And all I knew was is that I was a sinner, and I mean those preachers were talking about, you thou shall not drink, and my parents didn't. Nobody drank. Now, I have a theory. I said I had this theory. I have this theory that if my daddy would have taken a drink of alcohol, he would have been an alcoholic. Because I can assure you, he was restless, irritable, and discontent. And he was full of rage. And I absolutely understand that. Because I was full of rage. Absolutely full of rage, and that was my dad. But we did not drink. What happened for me is when I was 18 years old, I married an Air Force officer, and I had met my knight in shining armor, and we went sailing off into the sunset, and we were going to live happily ever after. Well, I had married a bomber pilot, And this man was going to be gone, and he was going to be gone for years at a time. And I was one of these people that I don't know if if any of you are like me, but I am just one of these people that just required a lot of attention. (laughs) I don't know if any other alcoholics were like that. I needed a lot of attention. And I was also one of these people... And in Texas, we call it puffing up, you know, when you, because I was born and raised in Texas, where you just kind of puff up. And somebody says, what's wrong? And you say, nothing. (laughs) But the truth is that you better figure out what's wrong, and you better make me happy. Clancy talks about there's absolutely no way that you can satisfy an alcoholic. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about nothing is enough. We just, there's not, there's no way that you can love me enough, that you can take, if you can give me enough or you can do enough. There simply is not enough for a person like me. And by God's grace, I get glimpses of having enough. On those days... Those days when I can, when I hook up and God and I are just, you know, we're just feeling really good together and I can be enough. I've got enough money. I'm pretty enough. I've got the right husband. Everything's right. And then the next day I can be off again and just not have enough. Just not, just, I'm suffering from a spiritual malady. And if you're suffering from a spiritual malady like me, nothing 
is enough. And the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says, I'm suffering from it. I'm suffering from a spiritual malady. At any rate, I married this man, and uh, we went off to California for our first duty station. And we were there, and shortly after we were there, I got this, this invitation in the mail. And on the outside of the envelope was stamped a big red mandatory. And I opened it up, and it was from the base commander's wife, and I was invited to a coffee. And <clears throat> I've always been one of these people. It seems like this just is a, a symptom of alcoholism, because it seems like most of, the, most of all the women I sponsor and most of the people I run into in Alcoholics Anonymous, we just always have this sense of we're just never enough. Just that feeling of I'm not enough, that I'm going to, uh, if I have to stand up when I was in school and have to give a book report, it just seemed like I would even, I would get sick because, and I mean really sick, not just fake sick, because I just couldn't stand up and in front of people. And then I got sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and met a guy by the name of Albert Myers. He's not around anymore, but he was an amazing man. And he just talked about, you know, people who just, we're just, we just require so much attention. And he says, and we're addicted to approval. And see, what it is, is I'm always wanting you to approve of me and think I do really good. And if I'm afraid I'm not going to do really good, I don't want to do it at all. And you guys went and changed that when I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. You said, if AA asks you to do it, the answer is yes. That's the only answer. It's yes. I got my friend down here who I'm just grateful to see is alive. And my God, as soon as you, as soon as they give you the, the okay, you're on the road again saying yes. You're saying yes again, Don. It's beautiful. I love you. I mean, this is what we do in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. We say yes. Well, what happened is, is here I am, and I'm 18 years old, and I've been invited to this coffee. And, uh, and I'm terrified. I'm just so overwhelmed with feelings of inadequacy because I know these women are sophisticated, and I know these women are educated, and I've always wanted to be educated. I'm still not educated, but I always wanted to be educated. And the whole thing was I, that I realized when it, you know, through inventory is I didn't want to be educated. I just wanted those letters after my name. I just didn't want to go to school. But what happened is I want the title, but I don't want the work. And those are the kind of things I begin to learn about myself in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. See, I want to be like them but I don't want to do what they do. And so I go to this coffee, and this lady stands up on, behind a podium, and all of us little second lieutenant's wives are sitting out around round tables, just like you're sitting. And she begins to tell us the things that we're going to do to enhance our husband's career, how we're going to have the right dinner parties, how we're going to show up to all the dining ins and how we're going to show up to the right parties and we'll have the right parties and we'll be dressed appropriately, we'll wear the right length gloves, all the things that we're going to do as Air Force officers' wives. And I'm, laying, I'm sitting there, I'm not laying, I'm sitting there thinking, <laughs> how am I going to do this? I am a hick from Texas. I don't even know where the forks and the knives go. And I have to go, I start reading all these etiquette books and how to, you know, how, what you do when you have parties and when you have dinner parties and how you behave when you go this place and that place. And I start learning to do these things. And that's what I did because I felt an obligation to do what I needed to do. Well, what happens for me is I haven't had a drink of alcohol. Oh, my God, I've needed a drink for a long time, but I haven't had a drink of alcohol yet. And what happens is, is I go to an Air Force officer's wife's luncheon. And what they have is I go in there, and they have a long table, just like this table here. 
and they got this big fountain on the table, and this liquid is coming out of the fountain, and all of these glasses are lined up. Today, I know they were sherry glasses. I hate to tell you, but my first drink was really a wussy drink. It was sherry. <laughs> and what happened is I saw these ladies picking up this glass and putting it under the fountain. And I picked up the glass, and I put it under the fountain. And what happened for me that day, I don't know if it happened to anybody else at that luncheon that day, but it happened to me that day. And what happened is, is something changed in my life that day. And I can remember it. I think it's absolutely amazing that alcoholics can remember their first drink. And I remember it as if it were yesterday. I can, as I get ready, I've told this story so many times to women I sponsor, to women I'm trying to 12-step. I've told this story so many times, and I still get the same feeling every time. I can remember when I took that sip and I swallowed it and that it was really warm and it just went down. And I took another sip, and it was warm. And all of a sudden, it just seemed like everything got warm. And it got, it's this, this knot that I'd had, I was just the most uptight person you ever saw. Just like a cannon ready to go off all the time. Really, hair trigger temper, just ready. Just always up, uptight. And all of a sudden, all of that just started to go away. And I put my glass up under that fountain again. And I had another drink of that sherry, another glass of that sherry. Now, I didn't get drunk that day. But I, had an, I, I was altered that day by alcohol. Now, I had no idea what happened to me until I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and I was given the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was read to me, and it talked about that feeling that I get that comes at once, that feeling that comes at once from taking a drink of alcohol, that feeling of ease and comfort that comes at once from taking a drink of alcohol. I remember it, and it worked until it didn't. It worked for me. Now, I don't have one of these really risque stories to tell. I always said, you know, I wanted to come in, you know, when I started coming into Alcoholics Anonymous, it seems like the badder your story, the better. You know, it seems like that gives you a lot of prestige. You got a really bad story. I got a, I sponsor a woman who had an affair with a one-legged preacher. I mean, you know, those are the <laughs> those are the kind of stories I wanted. And I didn't have a story like that. I didn't that was not my story. That that is not my story. What happened for me is is that I ended up having two little boys. And I had a husband who was gone a long time. If you have anybody that's in the service, you know that when they're deployed, it's just, it, you know, it's for long, long periods of time. And that's what happened for me. And these little boys were left in my care. And what happened was, is I just ended up getting, I was just having a nervous breakdown every 20 minutes with these little boys. And we were stationed in a place called Loring Air Force Base, Maine. And, I mean, it was like 40 below. I'm sure you guys kind of experienced that, but it was way up at the tippy top of Maine. And I should have known something was really going to go down really bad when they started issuing us these parkas that had fur around it and you couldn't even hardly see through them. I should have known it was not going to be good. But what happened is, is I had these little boys and I was just so uptight. I had no patience with these little guys. And what happened is I ended up going to an Air Force doctor, and he said, take these. And from 1962 
until 1977. I ended up taking Librium and Valium and Secanol and Nimutol and drinking alcohol. And what happens is, is when you take those kind of drugs and you drink alcohol, you're not an active alcoholic. And I was not an active alcoholic. I did my dying on my living room sofa. But I've got these two little boys. And I'm here to tell you that I am a woman who never, ever should have had those children. And if I had them, I should never have been allowed to keep them. Because as my first sponsor said to me, when I did my first inventory, he looked at me. I had done an inventory in treatment that was a five-step inventory, but it was one of those Hazelton inventories, and he let me know very quickly that that was not, that that made a, you know, a really nice novel, but it didn't have anything to do with, with inventory. And I did my inventory with him, and when I finished, he looked at me and he said, Polly, you are a child abuser. And I will never forget those words. And you see, in my heart of hearts, I knew that. Because you see, I couldn't stay sober because of what I would do to those little boys. Because when I was sober, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand what I had done. And I would end up taking another drink. And what happens is, is I have a son who's sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've gotten to hear him speak. And what happens is, is I've gotten to hear his story. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of his story. And what happened is, is as my children are growing up, I can no longer put them to bed at night. I can no longer get them up in the morning. They have to get themselves up. They have to sit an alar set an alarm clock, get themselves up so they can get to school. James talks about getting up one morning, and he comes into the kitchen. And what happens is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says that anybody who lives with a practicing alcoholic is affected by the disease of alcoholism. In fact, it says we make our families neurotics. That's what we do with them. We make them neurotic. And what I had done with my children, with my rage, with my abuse, with my physical, emotional, spiritual, blatant neglect, all of the things, get out of my sight, get away from me. My son James says he's bald because I always was pulling his hair. These are the things we do to our kids when we're, when we're alcoholics. This is what happens. A lot of us, an alcoholic of my type, and James gets up that morning. He has to get himself up for school. He goes into the kitchen. His mother is passed out on the, on the floor. A drink is spilled. And as he says, this is my reaction to that scene, he steps over me. He gets his cereal out of the cabinet. He gets the bowl, the milk, puts it all together, steps back over me, sits down, just very, very close to me, passed out, and eats his breakfast. And as he says, that's an abnormal reaction to that scene. That's what happened. But you see, that's normal for him. That was a normal scene in his life. My oldest son was the person who took care of me. He would try to get me to bed at night. He would try to help me. And many is the time I've come to with my oldest son screaming, Mom, wake up, wake up, are you dead? Because you see, if you take those kind of pills and drink alcohol, we don't breathe too good. And you know what? I haven't had to come to and see that kind of fear in anybody's face for 39 years. And for that, I've been overpaid in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had a son who was a, a musician. I had a son who was an athlete. And I'd say, I promise I'll be at, at your concert. I promise I'll be at your game. But you see, I'm going to take an a drink of alcohol because I drink no matter what. I take a drink of alcohol. 
I'm an alcoholic. I drink no matter what. I say I'm not going to drink, and I drink no matter what. I take a drink of alcohol, and I come to with these little faces down at the end of the sofa saying, Mom, you promised. And I start raging at my sons. Can't you see I'm sick? Don't you even care about me? And I make my alcoholism their fault. That's what we do. But thank God, thank God, we have 12 steps. Thank God we have a way. We can have, we get sick together. This is a progressive illness. But I'm here to tell you it's a progressive recovery. And if we pick up those steps and we work those steps and we get a sponsor and we listen to what those sponsors have to say, and when I got through with that inventory, Frank looked at me and he told me, you're a child abuser and you're going to go to those boys and you're going to make amends. How am I going to do that? How do you make amends for that? And he had me write out on these little three-by-five cards. And I still do that with the women I sponsor. Three-by-five cards, because he says, when any amends is emotionally charged, you better have it written out. Because if you don't, you might not get it out. And so I had it written out. And then he had me write out another card. And on that card it said, He had me write out, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. And I will spend the rest of my life being the very best mom I can be. And I went to my sons, and I made amends. And I did what the book said. And I did like what I was instructed to do by my sponsor. And I asked them if I'd left anything out, and did they have anything to say to me. And I want you to know that my sons were 14 and 16 years old. And that day, I thought they had both picked up an Uzi and shot me with it because they had a lot to say that day. They were very, very angry. And they had it. They just came at me with it. I'm so grateful that I fought, that I followed sponsor direction and that my sons had the opportunity to say to me what they needed to say. Because I can tell you right now, I have a relationship with my sons that is beyond anything that I would have ever known. And what I have had to do is be the very best mom I can be. I've had to learn to do that. I have had to learn to do that. I have lear- I've had to learn to not to be critical. I've learned from my husband. My husband has said, Polly, we don't want to be a critic. We want to be a coach. And one of the things is to learn to do that and not to put anybody down because that's what I would do. I would judge and hurt. And I can remember... Frank telling me, he says, you know what? You can tell anybody the truth if you come from love. But if you don't, the truth is a weapon, and you can beat somebody to death with it. And what I've had to do is to learn those things. Those are not things that come natural, but those are the things that we get to learn in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm just going to tell you uh, some of the things that happened to me when I got sober. Like I said, I don't have any, any stories to tell. I did my dying on my living room sofa. I had all my affairs sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. So, I, you know, none of that. You know, I, I did it all backwards. And uh, so what happened is, is I ended up having a car wreck in Irving, Texas. And... Uh, what happened is, as I hit a bridge abutment, and uh, I got out of my car, and I don't know, you young people won't know what this is, but I got out of my car and walked to a phone booth. <laughs> and I called the police and told them that my car had been stolen. And here comes the police with my husband. 
and I'm taken to the Irving Police Station, and I get to see that look on the non-alcoholic's face that just doesn't understand why we do the things we do. And this policeman looked at my husband with so much disgust, and he said, why don't you just take her home and sober her up? And on the way home, my husband says, Polly, there's a treatment center, and it's not far from our house, and I wish you would go. And that night, I entered treatment for the first time. And this treatment center was a seven-day detox. It was a county detox. This was not a fancy jitter joint. It was a county detox. And I went into this treatment center, and I'm here to tell you that I just want you to know about me and alcoholics. When I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't even know another alcoholic. I didn't even know anybody. I had seen days of wine and roses and I'll cry tomorrow. I'd seen those things. But I didn't know, I, it, none of that looked like it applied to me. And so here I am in this treatment center. And uh, first of all, some of these people had been divorced. Some of them had been to jail. Some of them had been to prison. And I looked at myself, and I'm sitting here, and I, we're sitting in group, and we're, you know how you sit in group, and you talk about uh, things, and you talk, I don't know if any of you have been to treatment, I've been a few times, and if you sit in group and you talk about, you know, all of these awful things that have happened to little boys and girls, and I thought, well, None of those things have happened to me. I can see why you're an alcoholic, but why am I an alcoholic? And what happened was, as I sat there and I just thought, people like me don't become alcoholic. Dr. Tebolt says that there's two characteristics found in every alcoholic, grandiosity and defiant individuality. My husband says, only an alcoholic can lay in the gutter feeling superior to those looking down on him. <laughs> Here, people like me don't become alcoholic. So what happened is I had a jitter house romance, you know, where sick falls in love with sick and you walk off into happy destiny. We walked off into happy destiny for 58 days. I was 12-stepped out of a motel room in Euless, Texas, and I was brought back into that treatment center, more dead than alive. I had been beaten up and a numerous and a sundry other things, and I'd reached that place in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that talks about pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I couldn't live with myself anymore. Clancy, I love to hear Clancy talk about the feelings of an alcoholic because I so relate. Because you see, what happened was, all of a sudden, I knew what my problem was. My problem was sobriety. I can't live sober. The facts of my life were, was that my husband was 100% disabled from the Air Force. He was 85% bedridden. My sons and I have for a long time felt like that he was a victim of Agent Orange because he got congestive heart failure at the age of 36. He was very, very sick. My daddy was in Hendricks Hospital in Abilene, Texas, dying of colon cancer. My sons were abused from their mother. These were the facts of my life when I entered the treatment center. And I sat there and I said, there is absolutely no way I can live sober. Because you see, I didn't understand. I mean, they had taken us to some meetings, but I didn't really get it. And I knew that there was no way I could live with myself. So what happened is, is I let that seven, day, that seven days pass. And when I left that detox center, I got a bottle of scotch, and I got a bottle of Valium, and I checked into a motel. I don't believe that there's anybody in this room that doesn't have an angel in your life. Someone who leads us to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had such a woman in my life, and she knew nothing about the disease of alcoholism, but she loved me. 
And she said that that day something came over her. And today I know what that something was. That was God working in my life through her. And what happened was, as she ended up driving around until she found my car parked outside this motel, and I hadn't shut the door all the way. It had just closed, but it hadn't latched. And she saw, on April the 8th, she saw me laying there, and she called 911, and I was pronounced dead on arrival in a hospital in Bedford, Texas. Now, by God's grace, I stand here today. And it is by God's grace that I am sober today. You see, anybody who walks through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous is given the gift of grace. We're given it. Webster says grace is a gift unearned. We've done nothing. We're the dredges of the earth, and we're given this gift. Look at us. Anybody walk by and think this is a PTA meeting? (laughs) I mean, we don't look like a bunch of drunks. That's not what we look like. Because we're sitting here in grace, the grace of being given a gift. What happens is I can remember hearing Sandy talk about that it's just lifted. It's just lifted from us. One day I can't drink no matter what, and then I'm given the gift of grace. One day at a time, I get a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. I'm given the gift of grace. When I got sober in Texas, these old rednecks in Texas, they used to sit back and just rock in their chairs on two legs, you know. And they'd say, you can't live today's sobriety on yesterday's recovery. You got to live today's sobriety on today's recovery. You better get up and do today what you got up and did yesterday. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I heard that. And what happened for me is that the state of Texas does not take kindly to people who try to take their life. They didn't like it in 1977. They don't like it in 2016. They still don't like that. So what happened is, as I was put on one of those little 72-hour holes and carted off to a psychiatric hospital, and what happened was that was enough time for my husband to obtain a court order from a Fort Worth judge that I was a detriment to myself and others, and I was court committed to treatment. And I entered that treatment center on April the 11th of 1977. And you know what? I stand here today grateful that God interfered in my life without my permission. That my life was interfered with without my permission. Because you see, I went into that treatment center and I caught the disease of alcoholism. And by God's great By God's grace, I am so grateful for that. And what happened is, is that I got out of that treatment center. I got to, I was invited, it was a 30-day treatment center. I was invited to stay six weeks. Some of us are a little sicker than others, so that happens. But what happened is, is they started taking us to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. They brought people in, and they brought meetings into us. And I started getting fed the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I started getting fed the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm grateful. One of the things that I got sober in Texas, and they believe in working the steps quickly, especially I was a relapser, work the steps quickly, and then study the book for a lifetime. And what I did was they took me through the steps. I got out of that treatment center. My sponsor took me through the steps really quickly. And I was doing a fourth step, and then I was doing a fifth step, and then I was doing amends, and I was into the, into action, into the, and I'm, I'm here to say some people say, well, you can take somebody through the steps too quickly. Good Lord, I'm glad that those words were not told to our 
co-founders and the people who started Alcoholics Anonymous, or none of us would be sitting here. And somebody says, when can you start sponsoring? My, my words are the same words that I got, that I give to my girls. Stay a step ahead. That's what you do. You better know a little bit about what you're talking about if you're taking that guy through it. And oh, don't to go through too fast. Well, Earl Bob talked. Doctor Bob took Earl Treat through it in his in his office in an afternoon. This isn't rocket science. And you know what? You can do it over and over again. If you don't, you know, it's not something you just do once. We're going to do this a lot. So don't worry about it. Let's, let's chop off the top of the iceberg, at least get enough so we can get sober. Go grab a newcomer. What's going to keep you sober? Go work with another alcoholic. I have people come up to me all the time and say, I'd like a one, I got this one time. I'd really like a new experience. Would you take me through the steps? And I said, you know, if you want a new experience, you go take somebody else through the steps and you'll get an experience. I get an experience every time I take somebody through the steps. You know why? Because I go. Every time I take a new woman through the steps, I get to go. That's how this program works. It's one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic. It's how we stay sober. I can be educated out to the gazoo, and that's a lot of self-knowledge but I better be out there putting it into action because it's no good. Faith without works is dead. I got to do it. I got to do it. And one of the things I used to say was, what if I do something wrong? And my sponsor says, if you're not making a lot of mistakes, you're not doing enough. (laughs) Get out there and do it. Ah. I had to hit a bottom in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that bottom was behind relationships and sex. Because you see, I just knew if you loved me enough that I'd be okay. I didn't understand. I didn't get I didn't get the eleventh step prayer and the twelve and twelve from Saint Francis of Assisi. I didn't understand it. I didn't know it was not about you loving me. It was about me loving you. And you know, in that Baptist Sunday school, I had gotten those tools. They used to tell us, you know, whatever you give, you get back tenfold. You know, I was taught those spiritual principles. And let me tell you something. These 12, these 12 steps, we don't, have, we don't have the corner, you know, on God. Spiritual principles are spiritual principles. And the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 traditions and the 12 concepts are spiritual principles. We live in this program. That's what the triangle is. 36 spiritual principles is what we live by. Spiritual principles. And I was given those spiritual principles. And you see, there was no way anybody could love me enough. And I had to be humiliated, and I had to be disgraced in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous because of my behavior. By God's grace, again, I didn't relapse. I did not take another drink while I was doing that that stuff to me. But I had this friend... And uh, he knew just about everything about me. I'd tell him he sponsored several of the men I'd had affairs with. And uh, we often had said if we'd have known we were going to get married, we wouldn't have told each other the things we told each other. And he knew more about me than he needed to. And uh, Dave and I were friends for three years. He was my best friend. And one day he came to me and he said, Polly, I'm in love with you. And he said, but I don't want to have an affair with you. I want to marry you. And you see, things like that aren't supposed to happen to women like me. 
And you know, on the 27th of this month, Dave and I will be married 36 years. It's been a love affair. It's been an absolute love affair. And he's had a heck of a year this year. Him and Don been battling cancer this year. Been a heck of a year. But you know what? Let me tell you, you take care of somebody the way I've taken care of Dave, and you think you know intimacy, you don't know a thing about intimacy. You really get to be, you really get to know somebody. You really get to know. You really get to feel that true intimacy. And Dave and I have got to experience that this year. But what happened was is I'm Dave's fourth wife. And as uh, one of our Al-Anon friends likes to remind Dave of, Dave, you are the only common thread in all of those marriages. And, uh, but Dave and I wanted to be married. And I was married. I've been married once before. But we wanted to be married, and we wanted to stay married, and we wanted to be principally married. And uh, Dave and I knew how to take a hostage, but we didn't know how to have a relationship. And I really didn't know how to have a relationship. My husband had been gone most of our marriage. And then he got sick. And so we started going to people. My AA sponsor had been a priest, and he had left the priesthood to marry an Asian woman. And I wanted what he had. And he's, I had two Franks in my life, and Frank Honeycutt sponsored Frank Fitzpatrick. And these two Franks absolutely carved my life in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and Dottie Harris finished it off. And now I have a new sponsor, Rena Kay. And one of the things that, um, that Frank used to tell me is he says, plant yourself in AA just like two oak trees, and you nurture yourself with the steps and the traditions and the concepts. And he said, like those oak trees, you'll grow up strong. But if you lean on each other, one will fall. But if you nurture yourself and grow in your own place, then one day you'll look up and you can't tell where one tree begins and the other one ends. And you know, Dave and I are in the last years of our life, and we're there. And it's absolutely amazing that we've got to walk this walk together for 36 years. And I know we got a lot more of them to go, we got a lot of years left to go that we get to walk this life together. But you know, we look at each other, and he's 80, and I'm 76, and you know what? I don't care how you slice that. You're in the last quarter of your life. It ain't going to be any different. That's just the way it is. And I'm grateful for what we've got here, that what we've gotten. And Dave and I met this couple in Omaha. And Dick and Peggy set us down one day at a table, much like that, and started taking us through their traditions and relationships the way they had done it. And Dave and I learned to practice the traditions in our relationship. And Dave and I have had, you know, life's been in session. We've been married coming up on 36 years, and I'm telling you, life's been in session. 1993, Dave lost his job. We ended up losing our house, having our house foreclosed on, ended up filing bankruptcy, and we were, 16, we were 14 and 16 years sober. And I'm looking at, you know, I looked at my sponsor, Frank Honeycutt, and he used to say, and I, he wasn't my sponsor, Dottie was, he was Dave's sponsor, but I used, Frank used to say, I said, I can't talk anymore. What will people think? And Frank said, it doesn't matter what people think. It only matters what you think of people. Your life depends on what you think of other people. You resent anybody, you can die. doesn't matter what they think. My sponsor, Dottie, had been through so much adversity in her life, and she said, Polly, somebody needs to hear your message. 2008, I didn't know the bottom was going to fall out again in our country, and we'd have another you know, time like we had in 1993. I didn't know that. And about half my sponsees were losing their houses, their husbands had lost their jobs. And I'm here and I'm going to say, honey, there's sobriety 
after foreclosure and bankruptcy. You will stay sober. God doesn't waste anything. He uses it all. I was reading a reading I read today, and it said, thank God for your troubles. Thank God for the experiences that we consider hard. And the reading said, I use it all, meaning God was speaking. I use it all. What does the book say about you and me? That our deep, dark past is our greatest asset. That's the thing that makes you and me have a common bond. That's the thing. We're people who normally would not mix, but we're alcoholic, so we have a common bond. We identify with each other. I can find my people in a crowd that aren't necessarily designated to Alcoholics Anonymous. I can find my people. We just can do that. We just have this radar. My husband's oldest son died. He died with seven years of sobriety. He died of lung cancer, what my husband just had. Life's been in session. My youngest son called me on the phone when I was six and a half years sober. And he said, Mom, I want what you have. And six and a half years before, I was supposed to attend a function at, its, at his school. And he stood in front of me with more anger than I've ever seen in a young man, and a young teenager. And he screamed at me and he said, don't you dare show up at my school because I am ashamed of you. And six and a half years later, he wants what I have. My son is 32 years sober by God's grace in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous. And he is an active member of this program. My oldest son was trying to take his life many, many times. And there was times I thought, I just, I can't, I can't do this. I got one son dying over here with the disease of alcoholism, and I've got another one over here that continues to take his life. And it's one of those things that I learned in the rooms of Al-Anon, is there's a lot of people who die from the disease of alcoholism and they never take a drink, because they die from the family disease of alcoholism. And he found a way. He married a Catholic girl, and he became a Catholic. And he found a spiritual solution to a spiritual malady, which is what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is, is a spiritual solution to a spiritual malady. Uh, there for a while, till about seven years ago, I used to tell that story. And I had, uh, I had, I have five grandkids who've never seen me drink. They think I rock. They just think I'm a, tons of fun because I'm a roller coaster riding grandma. I love to do those things. I just still like to get that thrill in my stomach. And uh, my kids were married, and you know, it looked like we were all recovering from the, you know, all of this. And lo and behold, both of my sons end up divorcing. And uh, that upset the apple cart and the grandkids. It's a little bit, you know, more difficult and all of that because uh, it just it just ended up being the divorces weren't good. And uh, right now, I am beyond happy. My son, my youngest son, got remarried on July the 30th, and. He married another member of this fellowship, and I'm telling you, they are so fabulous together. I am so excited, I can hardly stand it. And my oldest son is engaged to get married again, and I am so excited because she is so fabulous. And what happens is, is sometimes you don't know, and but it seems like that they've married women this time 
who are, are Russ hadn't married yet, who are crazy about them. And I am so happy. I mean, I'm absolutely beyond ecstatic. And the miracles just keep happening. It looks like it's a huge, you know, because sometimes it looks bad. It looks bad. In our eyes, it's bad. But, you know, look at, I mean, I look at my buddy here who's been through something that looked really bad. But are you a testimony to Alcoholics Anonymous? There you sit. And he's going to talk tomorrow night. These are the things we get to watch. We get to watch miracles on a daily basis in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are so blessed. I'm so blessed with the women I sponsor. I don't have a clue what I do for them, but I can tell you they save my life on a daily basis. Because you see, I'm a Bill Wilson. I'm the kind of person that left to my own devices I'll self-destruct because I suffer from depression. But I can tell you I have an antidote for depression, and that is work with another alcoholic. When all else fails, go work with another alcoholic. And by God's grace, my phone rings, and I get to work with another alcoholic. I get to sponsor, and I get to be sponsored, and I get to be of service. I get to I get to feel that feeling that Bill says in his, in, his, in his story. Today, I know usefulness. Today, I get to feel like I'm a useful person. And one of the things that I ever remember is I also steal from my sons. I got to tell, tell this, though. James and Dave and I were doing a little family panel in Tallahassee. I think it was back in maybe June or sometime. It was this summer. And anyway, I was speaking like I'm speaking tonight, and I was telling you the stuff about being a child abuser and all that stuff. So we get up, and we're doing this panel. And James gets up, and he says, Yes, my mother was a child abuser. I was abused. He says, But all of the things that have happened to me and my life needed to happen because that's what has made me the man I am today. And he looked at me and he said, Mom, get over it. <laughs> so there you are. So the other thing is, is that that, that God who's large and in charge is so full of forgiveness. We have been given so much forgiveness. We have been given so much grace. And as my son said to me when he came to AA, as he said, Mom, I knew AA worked because I saw the transformation in you. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.